And thank you all for tuning in uh, to us this evening. Um, I, I'm a laparoscopic colorectal surgeon uh, from Ireland, and I'm uh, the international fellow at uh, the IRCAD this year. Uh, so I'm going to speak to you tonight about surgical instrumentation uh, and uh, the development over the ages. Uh, and, and very briefly, I'm going to talk about the history of surgery, uh, the present situation, uh, and the, a glimpse or a hopeful glimpse into what uh, surgery uh, might be like sometime in the future. So surgery, the, the, the first evidence of any surgical procedures is actually about 10,000 years ago. People have discovered skulls that had holes drilled in them. These were called trephine skulls. Um, what is amazing is that from the uh, analysis of the skulls, people actually survived uh, this procedure um, for, for days, weeks, months, and possibly even years. Um, what's also interesting is that uh, these skulls have been found throughout the world uh, among communities that had no way of communicating with each other. Um, and you could imagine that this might have been to, to release some form of demon that was in the person's head or, or someone who was having maybe a, a seizure or some kind of activity like that. Then a couple of thousands later, years later, we entered the Bronze Age and we had tools. Uh, and you could imagine uh, these being used for very superficial procedures, uh, maybe um, lancing a, an abscess or something like that for, for the hunter-gatherers. Then again, advancing on thousands of years, um, for some particular reason that I'm not quite sure of, bladder stones seem to be a very big problem. Um, and you can see in the top left photograph here uh, some metal in instruments that were inserted uh, via the penis into the bladder, and if there was bladder stones present, they would rattle off them or make a sound, and that's how they derived their names. They're called sounds. And the bottom right picture uh, demonstrates the, what surgeons were like a, a number of years ago. They were barbers. They were itinerant barbers that traveled from village to village performing procedures. You could imagine there was no anesthetic or, or, or way of, re of controlling the pain. There was no way of controlling bleeding, and the instruments were very crude. So surgery at that stage was, was a, a grand spectacle. Someone was pinned down or, or given a lot of alcohol, and the surgery was very fast, very bloody. And this picture in the bottom right uh, depicts uh, a man, Frere Jacques, who used to travel around removing bladder stones and removed thousands of these stones uh, a, a, using this grand spectacle of surgery. So we'll advance on a, a number of hundreds of years and suddenly we're, we're, we're stealing uh, bodies from graves and discovering the anatomy of the human body and the physiology and exactly how the, the, the body works. And surgery does continue to evolve and you can see in the bottom right here a picture of the wound man and this is a, a, an illustration of what a surgeon would need to, what wounds a surgeon would be able would would need to be able to treat um, from a battlefield. Um, surgery was at a very, uh, just at very early stages uh, uh, then. Then it advanced quite quickly once we had um, three major discoveries. The top left is the, the Morton Ether Inhaler. And in October 16th, 1846, uh, William Morton anesthetized a patient uh, and a surgeon removed a lesion from his neck. And this was a groundbreaking event in the history of surgery. On the bottom left, we have Joseph Lister, who, after reading the works of Pasteur, began looking at a way of using uh, sepsis control for wounds. And he was working with carbolic acid, and he, provide, he applied it to a dressing and then put it onto a, a broken bone of an 11-year-old boy who, who had a cartwheel roll over his leg. And Lister wrote that he was very surprised that the abscess, which normally occurs, didn't actually occur. And moreover, that the wounds and the bones actually healed and fused together. And then on the top right, we have instrumentation that is crucial for surgery. That was also developing at the same time. And with the anesthesia and an asepsis and instrumentation, surgery began to advance. However, patients did still die of sepsis. And it wasn't until 18, 1928, when Alexander Fleming developed penicillin, that surgery really began to flourish. I do apologize for some gory pictures that are coming up. But basically, what happened then was that surgery advanced and advanced and advanced. We started moving into every compartment, the abdomen, the thorax, the, 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 the head. Surgery was performed in all areas, and we weren't just 
we began by removing small things and repairing small things and that grew and grew and grew into a time when we can now take an organ from one human being and apply it or transplant it into another human being and it works. This was really the era of big surgeons, big incisions. But big incisions come with a cost. A patient has to recover from them. They, have, they leave very large scars and they have problems such as infection, herniation, etc. So is there a possibility of, of doing this another way without the big surgeons? And the answer is yes. There, there is a, a more minimally invasive way or less invasive way of operating on patients. Um, the history of laparoscopy dates back uh, thousands of years. Um, Hippocrates first uh, started doing endoscopy when he had a, a rec rectal speculum for uh, examining into the rectum in patients. The bottom left picture there is a, a, the first uh, endoscope. It's a Lichter lighter by uh, Philip Bozzini that was developed at the start of the 1800s. It wasn't used until about 15 years later. Then around the turn of the, the, ninth, the, the last century, around 1900, um, there was three major developments. The first of these was um, uh, uh, Dimitri Oti, who uh, performed a, an examination of an abdomen in a pregnant lady through her vagina. Then um, uh, George Kelling uh, started examining the inside of dogs uh, with the small hollow scopes. People would have said he was crazy, that he was an idiot. What was he doing? He, that was never going to work. Uh, and then ten, a decade later, um, Hans Christian Jakobaus uh, started doing this in humans. He called his a, a laparothoroscope. Um, again, people would have said that this is ridiculous. It has no application. There's very poor illumination. That the, the, There's no instrumentation ready for this. But gradually, um, over the next... Uh, 80 years, things began to improve after a marathon of, of, of uh, exploration and discovery. Um, gynecologists mainly led the field um, and performing uh, diagnostic laparoscopies from as early as the 1940s. In the 1950s, Hopkins uh, developed the rigid uh, lens system. And then from the 1970s, gynecologists were performing routine diagnostic laparoscopies. It was a, a gynecologist, Kurt Sem, uh, who performed the first laparoscopic appendectomy in 1981. When he presented his work, the president of the German Surgical Society recommended that he should be suspended. When he tried to publish his research, they refused in certain journals, saying that it was unethical. And then in 1985, Eric Mua in Germany performed the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy. After that, there was a, a, a seismic change video started being used, or more specifically, closed-circuit television, and with the use of optic fibers, uh, Philip Murray was able to perform the first video-assisted laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and that was in 1987, and that is similar to the way we do it today, uh, using a four-port application, or four small, maybe one-centimeter incisions to perform the, the procedure, and he was able to watch what he was doing up on a television screen as compared to the very large open cholecystectomy scar that you can see there on the bottom right slide. So this was a seismic change. But of course, um, lapros laparoscopy came with a price, and the prices were that surgeons lost their 3D vision, they lost their tactile field, uh, they, they lost the intuitive uh, use of the instrumentation because they were now re working in reverse. But also another thing happened. There was no real control over the use of laparoscopy. And this certainly wasn't surgery's finest hour. People were learning how to do laparoscopy over a very short number of days and then coming back to their own hospitals and essentially training and practicing on patients, which we now know is not right. And um, things are much uh, more controlled nowadays uh, when performing any type of new procedure or using any new equipment.